All right, so first on our agenda today is me. <laughs> um, how convenient. Um, you all have agendas in your packets, so you can know what we're going to be doing over the next two days. Um, as uh, Rod said, um, part of the reason that we are doing these, it, this is because we have this grant money from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to help get, um, get more libraries, get information to you that you need about technology planning. And part of that is also this E-rate program um, that um, some people I'm sure are involved in. Are a lot of people here, I know I can't see you guys out there, but here in the room, um, are people doing E-rate in your libraries? If you don't know what I'm talking about, that's fine because I'm going to tell you about it. Okay, so we have some that are and some that aren't. That's great. And I'm assuming we have the same kind of breakdown on our other locations as well. And that's good because now our first uh, session here today, how do I get this to start? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Is um, to tell you about E-Rate, this federal program that you can use. And I'm going to bring up my presentation for this. There we go. Okay. okay. So um, in addition to being the special projects librarian at the Nebraska Library Commission, which is a nice vague title um, that I do a lot of different things uh, with grant programs, with um, other, product, other group projects that we have. Um, I'm also the state E-rate coordinator. And those of you guys that do E-rate, you know that. Um, previously, it was Richard Miller, who's out in the hallway. <laughs> um, so you may have worked with him on this. And now um, I'm in charge of helping you guys get all your E-rate things done. And so I'm going to take you through um, what is E-rate and why you would do it and how it all works. And then um, later on in the day today, we'll have information about doing technology planning and tomorrow more things that relate to E-rate and to technology in general. Everything will kind of uh, link together. Um, hopefully that's the plan when all of this is said and done. Um, now E-rate is a federal program out there that the federal government has set up that gives discounts to schools and libraries. So you guys are all libraries, so I'll mainly be talking to the library side of it, of course, but also schools can get this. Um, and you can get a discount on your telephone, your internet act bills, um, connections that you've set up for your internet. Um, you can get discounts on all of your bills. Um, it's funded through the universal service fee. You may see this sometimes on your cable bill, this little service, universal service fee. That's where the money that comes in to um, fund E-rate. It also comes from the telecommunication, telecommunication service providers provide funding for it as well. Um, it was created in 1996, so the first year you could get these discounts was in 97. Um, and the providers were ordered, as you can see from here, to provide their services to schools and libraries at discounted rates. And then they handed it over to the FCC to figure out how the heck this was going to happen. <laughs> they just said, we need to do this, we need to give them discounts, we need to help schools, we need to help libraries be able to have their phone service and be able to have their internet service and not have to struggle to pay for it. So let's get a federal program together to do it. And so um, the FCC was the one who is establishing the rules and how this whole program works. So some organizations, groups, names that you'll hear me talk about is the FCC, who oversees the entire program. What they then did, they, um, a company, a not-for-profit not company was created, the Universal Service Administrative Company, where you'll hear me mainly call it USAC. Um, they are the company that actually runs the EU8 program. There's the schools and libraries program, and there's also other ones that they, off, they have discounts on as well for health care providers, for low-income people. They've got other programs as well out there. Um, but the one that we're focused on is the schools and libraries division, which is the one for schools and libraries, the specific area of the USAC that um, does everything for you guys. So whenever you get anything that's related to E-Rate, you'll probably get a letter or something. It will say USAC on it. Um, and as I said, FCC sets the rules. So there's rules that were set up in the beginning. And since then, they have put out orders every few years about any changes to the rules. Now, E-Rate has been around since 1997 was the first year can, you could do it. And it's only been six times now, this past fall, that they've changed and made major changes to the rules. So the rules don't change all that often, but when they do, they release an order, we have to interpret it and figure out what all the new things are. So it doesn't change very, you know, too much, the basic rules. Some of how you do it changes, hopefully making it easier. They're always trying to streamline things. They did some streamlining of it this year. Um, 
So depending on what's in there, it may help you. You can see the sixth order was released in the fall and was effective this year. Um, there are some changes and things in there, but it's all in your information um, now. E-rate funding years run from July through June. So when you're applying for discounts on your bills, that's what you're thinking about is what I will get a discount from next July through next June. Um, the upcoming funding year is uh, funding year 2012. So we'll start July 1st, 2012 through June 30th, 2013. Right now we're in the middle of funding year 2011, so you can't get funding for this year anymore. You've, it's already The process is already done, but coming up in the fall, we'll be starting the process to do it for 2012. Um, there is $2.25 billion each year that is committed for this. Um, sometimes unused funds are rolled over. It's not very common, but it is in the rules that it can be. Um, now, though, they are, they, it was always capped until 2010 that they finally are now going to be increasing it based on inflation. It took them this long to figure out that that was a good idea, I guess. <laughs> so now it will actually be the cap will be higher every year based on inflation, so there will be more money available, um, which is good for you guys because they do not need to pick and choose from the applications. They get who, how much money they have and who they can give money out to. And you can see for 2010 it was $2.27 billion, and I don't remember exactly what it was for 2011. Now, who can apply? In this, and for the schools and libraries division that we're talking about, schools, library systems, schools and school districts, libraries, if you have a consortium, which we do not have in Nebraska, but you can have a consortium of libraries that are together, a consortium of schools, they can all apply. Basically, you do have to be eligible for LSTA funds, and specifically here in Nebraska, you also must be an accredited library, meaning going through the library commission to have your, all of your board and your staff accredited and your library accredited um, for all the rules that follow along that. Now, that is a specific rule for us. If you talk to somebody in a different state, your colleagues around the country, you may hear different rules from them about what their states require of them. In Nebraska, this is what we require, eligible for LSTA, which actually comes from the ERA people, and then the being accredited, that's our specific role. How much can you get? You can get up to 90% off of your bills, and that will depend on where you are. Um, you can get as little as 20%, but you can get up to 90% off on your telephone and internet bills. Um, now, this depends on, um, they do it on sort of a poverty-related criteria of how many students in your school district are eligible for the school lunch program. Um, and this is where the library is actually physically located. Wherever it's physically located, that school district is what you'd look at to see how many students you have. Um, and then you decide, you look and see if you are considered an urban or rural location as far as the uh, U.S. Census Bureau is concerned. Most of Nebraska is rural, of course. Um, which means you actually get a higher um, discount, possibly. Um, in Nebraska, the libraries that do apply, on average, uh, we get between 60 and 80 percent. That's where most of our libraries fall. We don't have very many that get down in the 20s. Usually it's more than that. And we only have a couple that get all the way up to 90. So it's pretty good. You can get more than 50 percent off of your bill if you go through this. Now, don't worry about writing down all these URLs. They're just here on the PowerPoint presentation. You've got that with you in your documentation, and we will have links available after this whole event is over for all of this stuff as well. Um, but there is a place on the Nebraska um, Department of Education website where you can see how many students are eligible in your school district for the school lunch program. Now, I know from, I've been doing E-rate training for uh, a year or two now, and I've heard when I've done some trainings that some people have had trouble finding this number that trying to call your school, they wouldn't give it out sometimes, or they would make it difficult to even, well, I'll try and get that to you. We'll see if we can get it to you. And so I had some places who had said, well, we didn't even bother because the school wouldn't tell us our numbers, so we don't know how to do our calculation. It doesn't matter anymore. The Department of Education puts it up. So you don't have to go through your school anymore. Yes, question? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh-huh. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, okay, the question is, I'll repeat the question, is um, someone did use that to look up theirs, and the if you notice in the previous slide, it said that pre-K cannot be included in that, so you have to be able to separate that out. Some, If you look on the Department of Education website, for some of them it does have it separate. For some of schools it doesn't. It depends on how the school has reported it at the Department of Education. 
in order to figure that out, then you would have to go to the school to see, well, how many of those were the pre-Ks, because we need to subtract those in order to E-rate. When the schools report these numbers to the Department of Education, they're just, they aren't doing it for the purposes of E-rate. They're doing it because they have to, it needs to be reported back. And for some of them, depending on your school, it will include the pre-Ks, so you'd have to go to your school to figure out which, how much of those to subtract out. Mm -hmm. Right, yes, if the secretary me. Right, yes, actually, it's a, yeah, it's a benefit. If your school is also applying for E-rate, then they would have had to do this themselves already, true. So they should have something already on hand if they're also applying for E-rate that does do this separating out because the pre-K kids do not get included in the school lunch count for purposes of E-rate. So if they're already doing it, yes, that they should be able to give you that number, no problem. But so when you are looking at what's on the Department of Education website, pay attention to how it says it. If it says K through 12, or rather, or but does it say pre-K? Because it will say on there. And if it says pre-K, contact your school to figure out what the um, what those kids are, so that you don't include them when you do your calculation. Because that will cause problems. Yes, you're not supposed to include them. Um, after that, you figure out your urban or rural status, which I've got a link here. There's a part on the USAC website where it just tells you every county in the state and whether you're considered urban or rural. Like I said, most of Nebraska is rural. Obviously, things like Lincoln and Omaha would be considered um, urban. And then there's a matrix they have, which I'll show you on the next page here, where you figure out the percentage of your eligible students and then whether or not you are urban or rural determines your discount. And you can see because we have rural, um, we are usually um, a little bit higher depending on your percentage of eligible students. And then that will tell you right off the bat, is E-rate even worth it to me? This is what I always tell libraries who contact me. Should I do E-rate? Is it too much of a hassle? Should I bother? Do this calculation first because you can do all of this without applying for anything, without submitting any forms. This is just going to those websites and looking up your numbers and doing the calculation. And then decide, is it worth it to get, am I getting 60%, am I getting 70%? off and then decide is depending on what your bills are is it worth it now to go through all the process of doing this every year. Um, E-rate is an ongoing process. It's something you do all all year long meaning there's forms at certain times there that are always due to keep doing and you have to redo it every year but once you get in the habit of it um, you'll always do it but always check this first and decide. Are we only going to get 50%? Eh, maybe it's our bills aren't that high. It's not worth all the hassle but if we're going to get 60, 70, 80 that might make a big dent in our, in our budget and be able to help us out a lot. Now, what can you actually get a discount on? Um, there is what uh, um, they call the Eligible Services List that is published every year. It's this huge 50-some-odd page um, list of every individual type of thing you can get a discount on, whether it's your phone, your internet, the different kind of connections you have, and they list it all on their website. So you can look up there and see um, is a 100 number eligible, which it is. Is it a voicemail, email, um, servers, a networking, construction we've had done. All these things are detailed out on the Eligible Services List. So you you can go there to see exactly what things are erateable. Um, and there are things that are added and changed to it each year. So every year a new one comes out. So you've got to make sure you look at the right list for the year. The basics of it now, like I said, it's a 50 some odd page document. So I'm not going to, of course, tell you every single thing <laughs> that is on there. But the basics of it is there's two priority levels of things that you can get E-rate from. Um, and priority one and priority two. Priority one gets funded first to get first priority. Um, telecommunications services and internet access. This is your basic telephone, your long distance, 800 numbers, anything phone related, and your basic internet bill. Basically you're paying for your internet, um, your monthly bill that you pay for your internet connection. Then priority two is other stuff. Internal connections, if you have networking done, um, wiring, all that kind of stuff. Stuff that helps you get your internet and your phone working. Um, and the basic maintenance of those. If you have ongoing maintenance, if you have a service plan, those kind of things are in there. Generally, the priority two stuff is not the kind of thing you have every month to pay for. When you first get a library hooked up, that'd be something that needs to be done. First getting network, getting your upgrades or whatever. So that would only come in randomly when you, as you need it. Your basic month to month would be your telephone and your internet, the priority one services. Um, priority ones are funded first, as it says, so you'll first hear about libraries getting that, and then months and months later, they start, then once they've 
put out all the money for the priority ones, they go back and look, okay, now who's applied for priority two services? Let's see if we have enough money and how much money we have for all those libraries. Uh, so if you do an application for this and you do some priority one, some priority two, you will get responses back at different times of year. You'll be told, yes, you've got your phone and your internet bill, here's your discount for that, you're all set, and we'll come back to you in a few months and let you know about those priority two ones you applied for because we have to wait and see if there's money left for that. So, filling out the forms. Lots of people I've heard, now I'm new to E-Rate myself, um, never did it before, never had to care about it or anything with it until I took over from Richard Miller to do it. Um, so I came into it a couple of years ago and they've got these forms are all online. You can go onto the internet, fill them out, it prompts you to do things, it's pretty cool. I hear from people though that the reason, one of the reasons that they don't do E-Rate is because Oh my gosh, the forms, are you nuts? They're huge, they're long, they're impossible to figure out, <laughs> they're terrible, they're pages and pages, and they just drive me nuts, I can't do it. Um, they've simplified it. If you looked at E-Rate five years ago, maybe ten years ago, it's totally different now. So don't be afraid of it. It still is a complex process. As you can still see, it still takes four forms that you have to do at a certain time every year. But it has gotten easier. Um, all the forms are available <coughs> excuse me, online, but they are still available in print. We do, I do still have people that prefer the print, or if you're inter I've had people with their internet connections at their libraries are not that great and they need to do the print, that still is available out there, no problem. Um, the four basic forms, you start off at the beginning of the year, well, the beginning of the year for submitting these forms is about in the, in the fall. Form 470, where you're telling them, I want to get E-rate, I want to get a service, I want to get a discount on my phone, on my internet. After that, you do a 471 where you tell them who you've chosen as your service provider. I'm going to get into the details of all these forms in a second, but this is just the basics of it. So first you say, I want to get a discount on E-Rate. Second, I want to, here's who I've picked to be my service provider for both phone and for internet. Then you wait, and as soon as your service starts, you let them know I'm starting receiving services. Our contract started in July, and we actually have our phone, we have our internet, we're paying for it. That's a form that for some reason lots of people forget. They apply and they think it's all done, but you still have to let them know, yes, it's actually started. And a lot of libraries lose their funding at that point. If you don't keep submitting all the forms, it just falls apart. And the last form is getting your actual money, saying you've paid your bills or you're going to be paying your bills and you want your discount. For anything that you do E-Rate related, any forms that you fill out, any documentation you have that's related to it, any letters, quotes, things you get from service providers, you have to keep everything for five years. Sometimes the government, FCC, will come back and do audits and check up on things. They can go back as far as five years. So make sure you just make files for things, maybe a file for every year. We have here, I have a notebook for each year so everything is separated. Um, but you do need to keep that because they may come back to you even after you've gotten your money and you've paid your bills, they've given you a discount. Someone reviewing something, remember this is a federal program, <laughs> so it's the federal government. Someone will come back in three years and say, I don't know about this thing here, let's go ask them about it. Now it is a federal program, it does have a lot of checks and balances things, but they do want to give away the money to you as well. The whole purpose of this program is to give out this money. It was set aside for this purpose. You still just have to go through all the steps for them, but um, don't think they're trying to keep it from you, they're just trying to, you know, there's going to be someone out there who questions it, someone who wonders where their taxpayer money is going to, and that's what all these forms and everything is for, but the whole purpose of this program is to give away the money, not to keep it. So this is, um, you probably can't read this very well, and that's okay. I did include a full copy of this on your flash drive and on the website for you to download. The basic timeline of when things need to be done. And this is a really good resource. A lot of people lose track of which forms they need to do, when they need to do it, what's the next thing, next step I need to do. This is a timeline that someone else put together, uh, <laughs> it was before me, um, that is really good for tracking all of this. Um, the order of the forms, what happens in between the forms, the different letters you receive back from the use, from USAC, all of that information is here. Now this does not have specific dates on it, so it's a nice generic one, um, because some of the dates haven't been announced yet and they do vary sometimes year to year of when the deadlines are for everything will vary, but this is the basics of it. Um, and we're just going to go into the details of this um, later on, so I'm not going to read through that whole thing right now, but you do have copies of that. Now, every year, every time you file a form, you get a letter back from USAC saying we received it, or here's your information back about it. 
Um, yes, you file your forms online. They send you your letters back in paper. Yeah, I know. <laughs> They're halfway there. <laughs> um, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if this is the reason, but they do color code each year when they do send you the letters too, which is nice. And the original, in the beginning, when they first started this in the late 90s, they did not color code the years. Everybody got everything in white, regular white paper, and it got confusing. You could be working on multiple years at the same time. Someone finally got the idea, let's color code it. So every year is yellow, pink, or blue, canary, pink, or blue, and then they rotate the colors. So you can coordinate, your, file your letters based on the funding year, based on the color of the letters you're getting. Um, if any of you have ever talked to me on the phone or an email, and I've tried to help you out, you'll notice I'll tell you, did you get the blue piece of paper? This year we're in blue for 2011. Next year I'll be saying, did you get the yellow piece of paper? It'll be on yellow. Um, so it is all coordinated, so you can color code it by your funding year. Uh, if they ever do go totally electronic for even replying to you, I don't know what they'll do. <laughs> color code the text. <laughs> But right now, you can do everything online. They will send you a paper letter in the mail. Um, so when you're doing your forms, make sure you've got the right address and name of the person who should be getting all these responses back so that they can get back the letters uh, from USAC. Now, technology planning. That's what we're here for, right? <laughs> technology planning is related to E-rate to a point. In the past, you had to write a technology plan for anything that was internet um, that was that was internet related, meaning if you're doing um, your internet access, you want to discount on that for priority one services. You had to write a technology plan, um, and of course, anything that would be in um, priority two, which is all internet related, you would have to create a plan. Starting with this fiscal year 2011, the one that we're funding you right in the middle of right now, if you're only doing priority one meaning your telephone bill and your basic internet access, you do not have to do a technology plan anymore. Which makes it a lot easier for some libraries. I know some libraries skipped applying for internet access because of doing this plan was a lot of extra work. It could be extra work if you don't have one already. For E-rate purposes, it's not required anymore. However, and this is the whole reason we're here. Yeah, I'm getting a little snarky. <laughs> technology planning is still a, an important thing for libraries to do. It's still a good idea. That's why we're all here for these two days. So we're going to be taking you through how to do these plans, why you should do them, um, the importance of them, ways to help you do them easily so that you do have these plans because you do still need to keep track of what you're doing, why you're doing it, what you might be needing to do in the future. Um, you'll actually get right into that this afternoon after lunch. We have our technology playing session and a cool tool to use to do it, make it very easy. Um, however, if you have been only thinking about technology playing in relating to, relation to E-rate, it's no longer needed if you're doing just your base, anything priority one, internet and phone. So it might make it a little easier for you now to jump into doing, a tech, doing your E-rate and getting your discounts. Um, for E-rate purposes, there are four um, elements uh, that you need to have. There used to be budget they included and they don't need a budget from you anymore. I guess they figure they trust you that you must have enough money and they don't need to know what your budget is anymore. Most people just included like their budget from you know, a spreadsheet anyway, so it was probably the easiest part of the whole form technology plan to do, <laughs> and now they've eliminated that as a requirement. Um, now, we're going to talk about <coughs> technology planning. Um, some of these things will be in when we talk about technology planning this afternoon. Um, we'll be talking about other things as well. I'm looking to Michael because he's going to be doing the, plan the talk. But these are the specific ones for E-rate purposes. So remember, if you jump down to doing priority two, you will need a plan, and these are the things that you'll need to have in it. Um, <clears throat> goals and strategies for using this technology. Why do you want it in your library? What are you going to be doing with it? What's it for? Uh, professional development strategy. Training for your staff. Making sure they know how to use these technologies and how to teach your um, users to use them. Um, assessing the, the services, um, do we need to upgrade this, do we need to upgrade that, excuse me a minute. <coughs> and then evaluation process, and this is evaluating your plan itself, not necessarily evaluating technology. That is also included in it, but you do need an evaluation process for how often are we going to look at our plan and update it. <coughs> Now, we, there is information on the E-Rate website and on our Library Commission website for how to um, do a technology plan. So that can help you out with it for the E-Rate purposes of it. Um, and the same thing, keep copies of it for that same five years. 
Uh, if you do uh, submit a technology plan to us, I do the approvals of it. I'll look over your plan, read it, decide if you've got all the criteria in there. Um, if you need to tweak something, I'll let you know. Um, we do uh, require, um, I don't know if you require, and which is not in here, um, for uh, accreditation in Nebraska, we're working on having technology planning be part of that. So that would be something that I'd be applying. Um, approving for you as well. So you'll be doing this for other reasons, not just E-rate purposes. But for both the plan itself and the approval letter that I send you, make sure you hold on to those also. Um, a few more specific details about them, and this is specific to E-rate, of course. Uh, you need to start writing your plan before you even apply for E-rate, before you do that first form, the 470. Um, just something that you've started, a draft. Doesn't have to be the final plan. Just get it going. Um, you can write them for up to three years worth of time. You can only have to rewrite it or re-evaluate um, it every three years. We'll let you do it up to that long. Some places do it every year, which is fine. <laughs> um, but you don't have to. You know, don't feel pressure that every year you have to do a new plan. It depends on how quickly you're, t you're, you're doing things, if you need to do one of that often. Um, approved by the U USAC Certified Tech Plan Approver. That's me. So you know that um, I would be the one to send that to. Now, SIPA, this is a hot issue for some people. Should we, shouldn't we, how do we, what do we do about it? I'm only going to talk very briefly about it here because tomorrow afternoon we have, tomorrow morning afternoon, we have sessions specifically on filtering and um, SIPA and more details about that. Um, if you are applying for E-rate discount for internet access or internal collect connections, you do need to apply with the Children's Internet Protection Act in order to get your E-rate funding. Um, this means having some sort of a technology protection measure, which they consider any sort of, any sort of way of filtering. And there's lots of different ways to do this, and as I said, tomorrow afternoon we'll have some speakers who will be here from libraries in the state, <coughs> excuse me, across the state, will tell you how, different ways of possibly doing it. You also have to have a plan, an internet safety plan, some way of what do we do when someone does access one of these sites? How do we you know, follow through with it? What do we do? Um, and then before you in, in, impose any of these technology protection measures, filters, you have to um, publicly announce that you're doing it. Let your, let your public, let your citizens know, we're thinking about doing this. We're going to let you guys talk to us about it. What do you think? Now, if you already have done this, you already have filters, you may have already done all these things already, so it doesn't matter. Not something new that you have to do. You just would have had to have done these in the past. And there is a whole page on the USAC website about SIPA. Um, but it's only for internet and internal connections. It is not for telephone access, of course, because you don't filter the telephone. I don't think you can yet. <laughs> um, but like I said, tomorrow we'll get a lot more into this. I'm sure it is a big issue that a lot of people want to talk about or have ideas about. I want to hear more about. We have a whole session tomorrow um, more specifically on that. Now, as far as applying online, this is the website to apply. And there is, and I'll run the left-hand side, uh, apply online is linked to go to the web page. I would also recommend if you're interested in E-Rate, if you do it, or even if you're just interested in trying to figure out what it's like, keep an eye on this website because they post um, notices about what's going on constantly to the page. So um, over here where it says the fiscal year FY 2011 window is now open 49 days, there's a countdown there letting you know when things are due, um, when things are open, when new deadlines have come up. So it's always a good thing to keep an eye on their website for that, in addition to going to apply online. And then you can see here, you can do your 470, 471, 486, all online, and also the other two forms the, the, uh, for getting your invoices are on here as well. And I pointed out here that, yes, it's all available online, but there is a link to instructions and PDFs of all the forms as well. So if you want to do it or need to do it in paper, you totally have that. Um, I also highly recommend looking at the instructions online before you go to apply online. When you're applying doing the online forms, there's a lot of prompts, there's a lot of help, there's a lot of where it'll do the math for you, which is great. But it's always good to look at it beforehand to see, to read ahead and see what do I need to c compile to bring together, what do I need to do to fill out these forms, and that's on the paper forms that you can get where all of the paper instructions are along with the paper forms. So I highly recommend getting a look at those, printing them out maybe, and having them next to you while you're filling out your actual online form, because it'll tell you how you need to do everything. Um, online and in print are all exactly the same. It's just paper or print version, or paper or online versions of them. Now, the specific forms. 
470, now we're going to get into the details of each form and what it's all about. The 470 is where you say, I want to get a discount. I want to start participating in E-Rate. This does not commit you to do anything yet, which is good. So this is just feeling out, seeing, telling them I want to do this. What you're officially doing when you do your 470 is opening a competitive bidding product process and asking for quotes from local service providers that will provide you with either phone or internet service or whatever it is that you're doing. By posting the form, it goes public. You don't have to contact these providers and tell them I'm doing this. You just send the form to E-Rate and then it becomes public and all these providers know to go to their page and see if there's anybody who wants to get service. And then you might be contacted by these providers trying to offer you a service. Um, on this form is where you'll say, I need local phone and I need long distance phone and I need internet. You know, you'll specify specifically what you need. Sometimes you won't hear from anybody, <laughs> and that happens a lot, especially in the small towns that we have in Nebraska. I have lots of people that we have who we have as our provider, and that's it. There's no one else to contact us and say, I want to be, you know, here's my bid for your library, and that's fine. And your own provider might not even contact you either and say, hey, I see you've done this E-rate. They'll just assume you've been doing it, you'll keep doing it with us, all good. Um, so you might not even hear back from everyone, and that's fine. But I also have heard that lately, in the last year, um, when I was doing training in the beginning of this year, suddenly service providers are um, contacting libraries who've never been contacted before by any of these companies. And so people were surprised that somebody actually is wants to give me a discount. I've never heard of this company before. I think my guess <laughs> is a lot of these service providers are getting kind of desperate because when some of these libraries got back to them and said, okay, I'm in so-and-so town, what can you give me? Then the company said, oh, really? Oh, well, we don't serve that town. Oh, okay. So they're just doing this blanket kind of thing saying, oh, they're kind of in Nebraska, and we kind of knew Nebraska, let's tell them we'll give them a discount in service. And then when you finally get down to talking to them, they, about half of the ones that I talked to, they ended up say, telling the library, oh, well, we don't serve your town, so never mind. So be aware of that <laughs> if they do contact you. Um, they may or may not actually serve where you are located. Um, you must post to have your 470 uh, submitted, and then you've got to wait 28 days before you can do your second step, which is where you tell USAC who you've picked. This is in order to give a, a decent amount of time for any other vendors or anybody to contact you. This is where the competitive bidding process comes into play. Um, they put up uh, deadlines and dates on the USEC website, and I announce it as well through the commission, of what's the latest date you can possibly do a 470, and then do your 471 so you can, you'll know all these deadlines um, so you can keep track of it. Um, if you do get any other bids, you've got to keep track of them, and then you've got to decide. You've got to compare these different companies, if you do get multiple ones, to decide who you're going to go with. Uh, price is a primary factor. They always want you to get the biggest, best deal, but it doesn't have to be the only factor, and it shouldn't be the only factor in why you pick a service provider, of course. Um, some of you may know, if you have multiple providers in your town, these guys are really good, and even though they cost more because the other guys down the road, eh, their customer service is not so hot, we don't want to deal with them, or for whatever reasons, you know your local people. And that can be taken into consideration when you're doing your criteria for picking your provider. Um, some things that will come up when you are doing this, for, this form, you all are assigned a build entity number, your BEN number, you'll hear about that. It's just an ID number assigned to each school and library. I think pretty much every library in Nebraska has already had one, has in the past done something with um, USAC. If you're brand new to it and you never have done it before, um, or if you're not sure if someone has done it before you in the past, we can look it up and see if you have one. And if you don't, we just call and they assign you one, no problem, and then you're able to go through with your submitting. And this is a number assigned to your particular library. And it is used throughout the life of the library for as long as it's doing anything with E-Rate with USAC. Um, so if someone before you was the director, they were assigned a number, they should have passed that information on to you. If they did not, that's okay. Like I said, um, we can go and look that up. Separate from that is a personal identification number, a PIN number, that is assigned to individuals. This is a code number that can be used for you to put your signature on any online forms that you submit. So this goes to you as an individual. If a previous director had one, you can't use theirs, you've got to apply for your own. Um, and it's not a big deal to apply for your own. I know some people do, because there's a 
deadlines are coming up really quickly and they use the old one just to get some form done and that does happen and as far as I know USAC has never gone and tracked down and said well you're not really Sue you're Bob um, but what you should do is when you're new even if your previous director or previous person at your library has been submitting paper, uh, online forms do one form in paper and that will get they will get your what they call your wet signature where you actually have to physically write your signature on it then they'll issue a pin and then you're back to online for everything and you just use that pin number to sign all of your online forms that you submit with them um, after you have sent them their 470 they will send you back a letter in the mail in whatever color is for that year which is your receipt notification letter just letting you know we got your 470 here's a summary of what you wrote on it Double check it, make sure it's right, <laughs> if they, anything got missed in translation or in applying for the form um, for, for it, and um, let them know if there's any changes or any mistakes that were on it. Then once you get that, you've got to wait your 28 days before you can submit your 471, which is your form letting them know who you've picked as your provider. Um, Oh, this is what I talked about, the competitive bidding process. Um, it's public. You don't have to do an RFP, a request for, for, for price or proposal. Some uh, municipalities or cities or counties do require you to do that, so check with your city in case you need to or not. But most of the people I've talked to in Nebraska is not required. You don't have to do it. Um, just submitting your 470 serves the same purpose as that because it puts out exactly what you want, how much you need, what bandwidth you need, what phone you need is all on there. Anything a provider needs to say they want to provide you with service is on that 470. If they come to you and say you need to do an RFP, tell them no because you don't. <laughs> it's only required if your side, like your city or town, makes you do it. Um, when you do the bidding, uh, evaluating, as I said, um, price is the primary factor, but take other things that you know about into consideration. Um, some libraries you can do a little matrix of price is 51% of our decision-making process, but all these other things are these. Or if price is 49% of our decision-making, but then we decide on their location and how their customer service is and previous history, you know, all those things can be different parts of your decision-making process as well. Just be able to, if anyone asks, because they don't always ask, be able to back up why you picked this provider over a different one, especially if there was a price difference. Um, just be able to show, well, we know this about them. Put stuff in writing. Write yourself an email that has a date on it. Write a memo and put it in the file. Just something that says, here's the reasons why we picked so-and-so over so-and-so. And like I said, this is only if you get multiple ones, which the trend seems to be in our state, not a lot of that happens. Um, after you um, have done all that, you've got your 28 days, um, the ACD is the allowable contract date, the time when you can finally say, I have picked my vendor and who, here's who I'm going with. Sometimes it might just be, I'm sticking with the same people, I'm sticking with the same company, and that's fine. You're still going through the process for E-rate and the federal government of saying, we put out our bids, we waited, um, we put out a request, we waited, and we're still sticking with the same company. You're just telling them that. To your service provider, you're just continuing your same contract, you're continuing your same process. Um, in June, you pay your bill. In July, you pay your bill. Um, they're all doing this, too. They've all been doing E-rate for years and years, most of them, um, so they know the process as well. There are some service providers out there. I, we have heard when we've been doing some talking to some libraries now with this grant that do not participate in the E-rate program. Um, it's rare. It shouldn't be happening. They're supposed to all be participating, but if they're not, you may need to talk to them about that, that they need to get on board with it. Otherwise, they might not get your business. That is also a reason not to choose a vendor is, well, if you're not giving me the E-rate discount, then I'm going with so-and-so down the road. So your next form to do is your 471. And this is where you then finally tell them, yes, I've picked my service provider. Um, you let them know who it is, what um, services they're providing to you. Um, this is where you put in finally your discount. You let them know how much of a discount you are eligible for. You would have already done that calculation in the beginning to decide if you even want to do this. But this is where you finally reply that, um, um, enter that into the form to let them know. And this is where they'll check on that for you, where they will double check information and, and numbers and everything to make sure you have that all correct in there. Um, as I said, you wait that 28 days. It's very important to wait. If you don't wait the right timeline, the right number of days, they will, you will get denied. If you don't do those 28 days, you won't follow the, the dates that are out there for all of this. Um, you just won't get the discounts. 
Um, for the 471, and what's in bright red here, um, which we don't know right now, there's always a filing window that is announced. It's announced usually sometime in the fall, and it runs usually November, December to January, February, March time frame, and that's the time frame for when you can apply, uh, submit the 471. It's only during a few certain months during the year that you can do this form. <coughs> the application filing window is announced, then you can um, figure out when is the last date I can possibly submit the 470 to give that 28 days. So right now, you can start doing your 470s now if you want to for the next year, and then just wait to see what this filing window is to figure out when the deadline is and to get all of that done. Now something new was added to the 471 this year, and anyone doing it for 2011 encountered this. They're asking for an FCC registration number. This is not your library's build number, a build entity number that you had for the library. This is not your PIN number for you individually. This is something new to the form, but probably not new to your library. Um, lots of libraries didn't even know they had one of these. I didn't know. <laughs> um, any library that does business with the FCC, anyone who's done business with them at any time for any purposes, E-rate, taxes, whatever, has been assigned one of these registration numbers. You may just not know it because you never had to use it for anything before. Um, but now they're asking you to ins put this number in the 471. It's for the FCC people. And there's a pay uh, if you don't know what it is, there's a place where you can look up your library's number or request one if you don't have one, if you've never done business with them before. Um, last year I had lots of libraries call me and say, what is this? I don't know. What? what? Everyone I looked up had one. So didn't realize that there was one in there. We didn't have to request one for anybody as far as I knew last year that I was aware of. So you have one. Um, we just have to figure out what it is. It has this long 10-digit number that you probably never use for anything else and won't use for anything else again, but the FCC wants it on the forms now. Um, after you send them the 471, they send you back another letter, their C acknowledgement letter. Same thing, just provides confirmation of everything you entered in the 471. You can make check corrections to this form as well in case you get this letter back and it turns out they said something wrong or, or copied something over wrong. Um, you can do uh, corrections to the form. You can also request changes in your funding. Sometimes you discover after you're going through this process that your bill is actually less from the service provider or you decide not to go with internet just to go with phone. You can request reductions but not increases. So um, think about that as you're doing your original forms that you can't up anything if you suddenly discover that your bills have gone up. Um, on the form, when you, on the letter when you get it back, every request you've done will be assigned a funding request number. They'll call it a FERN. Everything gets an acronym, of course. So each request you did, your telephone request will be assigned a funding request number. Your internet will be assigned a funding request number. Your long distance phone will be assigned a funding request number. And these will be things that people will be asking about for future forms and future information. Um, each service provider has their own service provider ID number. Like you have your build number, you have your PIN number, they have a number assigned to them. Um, we're all numbers now, obviously. <laughs> Um, if you've done this before, you've probably known what your service provider number is. If not, it also can be looked up on the USAC website. All this stuff can be looked up there, too. Your numbers, their numbers, everything. There's always a place to look something up if you're not sure what it is. When you do submit the 471, you do this little attachment called an item 21 where you just specify in detail what you're actually now getting from this, the, the provider. This is long distance phone number for the library and its staff. This is the internet connection for all these computers in the computer lab. Oh, and this is just a repeat of the fact that you can get things changed. Oh, let's change that. So after you do the 471, this is when you wait. And you wait to see if they're going to give you the money and how much money they're going to give you. Um, they will be checking over your forms and all of your information and information about the service provider you're going with, um, your discount that you claimed you had, where your library is located, anything that's in there, they're going to be verifying and, um, in there. And this is what they call their, uh, you'll hear it called the PIA review program, integrity. Um, assurance review. So they'll be coming back to you and asking questions sometimes and saying, did you, what did you mean by this? Oh, can you give me more information about this? Can you give me proof of um, this? I've had a lot of libraries being asked, um, can you prove your, your school lunch program numbers? 
like, you know, go to the Department of Education website. <laughs> so you just send them that link. I mean, they don't always go through those steps of searching, like going on to Google and searching and finding that the Department of Education has this. They just say, I wonder if this is right. This doesn't sound right. Let's ask. And they let make you tell them this is where I got that number from, the Department of Education. And this can take months and months. You will see notices go out saying, these list of libraries have been funded, and you're not on it. And then next week, you'll see another list, and you're not on it. And then next week, another list. They can take um, months and months to get through all of these applications they get. So don't panic that yours isn't on there right off the bat. They may still just be going through their piles of applications they have. It doesn't always mean something is wrong with yours. It just means it's this far down in the pile of what they're doing. Whenever they do uh, decide to uh, let you know, you get a funding commitment decision letter. Let you know if you're funded or not and how much you'll be funded for. I've had some libraries where they say, yes, you can have it, but we're actually lowering your discount. <coughs> we can argue with that. <laughs> um, and you may receive more than one of these, too. They may make the decision on your telephone, but for whatever reason, wait and three, months, three weeks later make the decision on your internet. Um, it's all a huge process of people they have doing this. So pay attention when you get the letter to see what exactly it's for. So you know, okay, we've got this one, we've got the other one waiting. Um, as I said, you can appeal anything on here if you think it's wrong, if you don't agree with the fact that they didn't want to fund you or did want to, or wanted to fund you for less. You can always do appeals for this. Um, like I said, they want to give you the money. That's the whole point of this program is give away this money. It's, it's earmarked for these purposes. It's not like they can take it and just roll it into some other government program. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> it has to go out to the schools and libraries to be discounts on these bills. So if you want to argue something, I say go for it. I will help you with it. I've been helping some libraries with some of their issues um, with it. Um, but it may take some time for them to go through their whole process, but it doesn't hurt to say, I don't agree, you did this wrong, whatever. <clears throat> There's detailed information about doing that on the, on the uh, USAC website as well. Um, program integrity insurance, that's who I was talking about, that actually reviews these things for you. So if you ever get any contact from them, <clears throat> it will come from something called PIA, a PIA reviewer um, will be what they are. On your forms, the 470, 471, there is a spot where you say where, how you want to be contacted. Do you prefer telephone? Do you prefer email? Remember what you said there, because that's how they will contact you. That's the only way they will contact you. If they send you an email and you don't get it, they're not going to try and call you, too. They're just going to do the one thing that you said was your primary way of wanting to be contacted. And if you don't reply back to them, they always give a deadline. You have 15 days, 30 days, whatever. If you don't reply back to them, they assume you don't care and your uh, uh, application goes away. So make sure you have it be a way you will be responding to them and getting the phone call if it's a phone call, getting the email and reading it if it's an email and responding to it. The next step in the forms that you do is your starting of your services, your 486. This is where you tell them. Um, this is where some reason libraries forget this. They think, I've applied. I've told them who I want. They told me I got my money with that funding commitment decision letter. I'm good to go. Well, you're not. <laughs> um, this is where some libraries just forget and just don't do this, and then they don't get the discount. You've got to tell them that the service has actually started that our contract has begun, that it's all good, that the service is being provided, and we're getting it like we said we would. Um, it also certifies if you had to do a technology plan. This is where you tell them, yep, we did one. You don't send them the plan. You just say yes. They may ask it for you, you for it. Whoop. Ah. What did I do? OK. Um, and you, the deadline is 120 days after the service starts or the date of the funding commitment decision letter, whichever is later. Um, so you do have a deadline for that too, but it's on that funding commitment decision letter is that date as well. So it's all on there. Um, after you have submitted that, you'll also get a notification letter back. Same thing. Everything you send them, they'll send you a notification saying, yep, we got it, yep, we got it. Make sure you get those letters back and you have them proving that they've gotten the form you submitted. If you haven't gotten one of those notification letters back for anything, go and check with them. Contact someone there or contact me and we can find out, well, you said you submitted it on so-and-so date. Let's find out what happened to it. <laughs> um, yes. Then the last thing you do is the invoicing. This is after you've started receiving the bills, you can decide how you want to receive your discount. You can either have pay all your bills in full and get a reimbursement check back, 
or you can have the bills discounted in the first place and the bill you receive from your service provider is already discounted for whatever the amount is. It's up to you which way works with you, with your accounting um, people, um, with your uh, city or town if, that, if they have issues with how this is done. Sometimes it has to be worked out with the provider as well, that they prefer to do it one way or the other or worse, easier billing wise for one way or the other. But you do have a choice. So um, talk to your money people, your budget, your bill, um, business people and find out which way works best for you. Um, if you want to be reimbursed afterwards, you do what they call the bear form. The um, build entity applicant reimbursement, that's the reimbursement one. Um, and you submit that and then you pay all your bills in full and you get checks back from the, um, from the uh, USAC with the money. So it comes afterwards. You do have to have the money ahead of time to pay out, and then you get a reimbursement check, reimbursement check back. Um, your other option is the service provider invoice form, where they submit the form, actually. So you wouldn't submit it, but you would have to talk to them first and find out, is this the way we want to go? And then they submit the form to USAC, where it says, we're just going to discount the bill in the first place to the library. And then USAC sends them the reimbursement, not you guys. You guys just get a discounted bill right off the bat from the service provider. In the end, the service provider gets all their money. That full billing. They just get part from you and part from the government. So up to you to decide which way you want to do that. Um, you do get a notification letter for the bear letting you know that it has been submitted and everything has been done and you'll be sent quarterly a report letting you know all of your bills and all of your discounts so you can track and make sure how everything is going uh, throughout the year. If you do need help, they have people on staff there all the time um, to help you out. They have they do regular kind of nine to five hours, eight to five hours. Uh, during uh, big times of when a deadline is coming up, they will have extended hours. So they'll be open till like 11 p.m. midnight. Um, they are based Eastern time zone because they're in Washington D.C. So pay attention when they do time zone things that it's. It will say Eastern, and you got to you know bump it back for Central. Um, but you can call them; they have an 800 number. Um, they have a website, where, a web form online where you can type in a web form if you want to ask them something. Um, and they will—they're really quick. I've actually asked them some questions about the commission's um, application. We apply as well, and they're usually very quick with response on that. Um, anytime you do talk to them on the phone, definitely uh, confirm in writing. Make sure you have everything somehow in writing in the end, so you can say, "Well, on this date, you know." Susie from SLD told me this, this, and this, and now you're telling me the different thing. Here's my email when I confirmed with her what she said. Um, that's always a good thing to have. Um, there's also places on the website where you can get information. The, the news briefs, that's where they have their um, every, every week they do an update of what's going on with E-rate. So you can sign up for that and email. I get it. So just let you know, here's what's coming up next. Here's the new deadline coming up. Here's a new thing we've announced. Here's a change made to the forms. Um, and the process flowchart that's on here, this is a long URL for that. It's also included on your flash drives and on the website for this event. It's a flowchart of showing exactly each step in the process for both you as a library and the service provider. So you can see what they're having to do too. They've got all these forms themselves to fill out like you are. I haven't told you about any of that because you don't want to know what they have to do. <laughs> but they do have a process as well. So you can see that you're both doing different things throughout the um, year. Um, and, of course, like I said, I am the special projects librarian slash e-rate, uh, state e-rate coordinator. Um, I've got a website up with lots of information, links to all these things on their website. <coughs> Excuse me, links to their forms for our forms um, that can help you out. And, of course, you know where to find me. You can call or email me about anything that you want to know as well. Um, so that is the basics, very quick, yes I know, of E-Rate. <laughs> um, I do longer sessions of this where I, longer trainings that I will be doing, that I usually do in the fall when these forms are up of, um, available of actually how to submit the forms, all the different forms that are out there step by step. But this is just to get you the basics of how the program works, what it's all about, um, what might help you if you're a current provider or a current user of it to learn something you didn't know maybe, or if you've never used E-Rate before to see if maybe it might be something you want to do. So we still have about five minutes left in, yes, for my um, time here. Does anybody have any questions here or any questions from out in our remote locations? Michael is over here monitoring um, our remote locations out there and he can bring in any questions we have here too. Yes, Stan. Mm -hmm. 
Um, sometimes. The question is when you do a PIA review and so they do ask you for something, some sort of information, and then you never hear back, well, what do you do about it? Um, is there something you can do? There is, um, depending on the situation, there is a spot on the website where you can look up the status of your, of your application. So you can see where it is in the process when they have it. And if you know it was being held up for some reason, you can go there and check and see if it's been bumped and moved along in the process. They, for some reason, don't, aren't very good about responding back and saying, yes, we got that and now we've moved you on. They just kind of do it and then you suddenly get your next acknowledgement letter or whatever. Um, so you can look it up online there. If it still doesn't say what you want, I strongly recommend calling them or contacting back the PIA reviewer who contacted you in the first place just to have them double check and let you know. I sent you this thing three weeks ago and I'm not sure what's going on. Can you please let me know? Um, but you can check it yourself on their website and then, yeah, nag them. Why not? That's what they're there for. They're there for you to do your review and get your form through the process. So you can, yeah, do that. Oh, yeah, yes, yeah, sure. Yes, the question is, if you already have your phone and internet, do you still have to go out and go through the process of getting the competitive bids? Um, yes. Um, by, submit, by just sub filling out and submitting the 470, you've done that, though. You don't have to do anything extra. You just apply for E-rate. It becomes public. Providers may or may not come to you offering up their services. Um, a decision-making, part, part of your decision-making process can be, and one of your major reasons for staying with a provider is, we're staying with the people we've been with for 10 years. There's no reason to change. They've been great. So you still do, by just submitting the 470, you kind of go through the process, <laughs> um, but with no extra work. And then if you never hear from anybody, and even, or uh, sometimes you don't even hear from your own provider, you just say, cool, it's been 28 days. I'm on to my next step in the form, in the process. And then really what you're doing is you're just saying, I'm going through the steps that I'm required to to get the discount for E-rate, but I'm sticking with the same people. Yeah. We have a remote question. We have a remote question. Yeah. It's on. Okay. okay. Um, and I think we'll be getting into this tomorrow a little bit too. Okay. But the question is: SEPA only requires that public access computers be filtered, right? Not office computers. Wrong. Wrong. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, that's not true. SIPA actually says all of it, all of the library's computers, all of its computers is the wording, must have a filter on it. Which means, yes, every computer, both public and staff, need to have filter on it. However, also it says you have to have a way of turning off the filter very quickly and easily and simply. So you do have to install it on your staff computers, but then just turn it off and that covers the requirements for it. Um, the SIPA law is very short. I've also included that in your flash drives. It's like 12 pages long. It's this tiny little thing. I was surprised when I read it. I was like dreading looking at this. I was like, this has got to be some huge, ridiculous thing because it's all about internet safety. And it's not. It's short and brief. And that's one of the things in it. It doesn't say, it doesn't differentiate between public and, and staff room. It just says it must, a technology protection measure must be installed on its computers. It's being the library. And that's it. But you do have to turn, you, uh, also it does require a, a way to turn it off. So you do install it, but you turn it off. Anything else? Yes? Did I understand you right that a library has to be accredited to apply for email? Yes, here in Nebraska. The question is, um, did I understand that a library has to be accredited to apply? And that is a specific um, requirement here that we have in Nebraska, yes. Has that changed? Not that I'm aware of. What, it wasn't before? Okay, well, it might not, maybe before my time it wasn't. <laughs> that could possibly be if you're thinking. But as far, as long as I've been doing it, which has been a whopping like two, three years, <laughs> um, it has been. Uh, that would be a question for other people like Rod, Richard, I don't know. The, yeah. Because you're not going to be able to. Mm. Mm. The comment is that they some. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. The comment is that, that someone's been doing E-rate for a long time. It's been a great um, help and to getting the discount. But if it is required that they be accredited, that might not they might not be able to do it E-rate anymore because of budget cuts and other things needing to be reduced at the library. It may mean they they will lose their Nebraska State accreditation. That's something to be thought about. I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> It's not my part of my job, that part. <laughs> yes? Really? Mm. They did put it back. Yeah. Um, the comment is that a couple of years ago, the DOE had taken off those um, school lunch numbers from the website for privacy issues, um, so that the libraries then had to switch to going to the schools to get it. Um, well, they're all, they are back up now, but there's just a few years back. It doesn't have like 20 years worth of them. No, that's true. It's, all, it's got maybe three or four the last time I looked. I would have to look at it again, but they are up there now again. Um, I don't know if they figured out a different way to put it up or they got over that issue. I don't know. <laughs> I just found it. It was out there and I and checked with them. They said, yeah, that's the numbers. And so, yeah. It's kind of interesting with me being new to this, too, that I don't have a lot of this history myself. I have Richard, <laughs> who I can ask sometimes, um, but some of it I just go with what I know at the moment. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes, one more question. Do you have anything from... Okay. We'll do one more question, because then we need to go to lunch. Yes. Oh. Mm, interesting. Yeah, interesting comment of some schools are not reporting their school lunch program numbers because they are embarrassed that the students are getting it or the students themselves are embarrassed. Well, they if they are still doing that, that's just something what we to the USAC to the E rate people, there is an official number on the DOE website. If there's these things, these little political, whatever things behind the scenes that we know about. We just don't need to mention that. <laughs> um, there's an official number out there and it's public and so we just go with what's out there and that's what we go with. Um, unfortunately though, the more that uh, students that are eligible for the program, the better a discount you get. So it kind of will hurt, it will hurt you E-rate wise. <laughs> yeah. Because it will be helpful, yeah. And there's no individual names. It's a big ground number. It just says this number, number, this these many students. It doesn't have any personal information. Yeah, and you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>